Should I share? So we are going live in three, two, one. We are live now, sir. Siroi, sir, you can start the event. Okay, sir. Respected President and Secretary of the Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association, learned faculty, panelists, and dear audience, welcome to the Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association's Shoulder Symposium. It is the first in the series planned every second and fourth Thursday. We will be designing these symposiums in a way that novice or experts all will benefit by the end of the day. First of all, I would like to thank Uttaranchal Orthopedics Association President and Secretary for giving me the responsibility to start these symposiums. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ashok Sham, Director Ortho TV, for giving us the wide coverage for this. I would thank our faculty, Dr. Jitendra Maheshwari from New Delhi and Dr. Panak Bhushan Divedi from Dhanbad, who acceded to my request on my first call. I am thankful to the panelists, Dr. Naveen Agroi from Rolki, Dr. Tarun Solanki from Kashipur, and Dr. Ganesh Singh from Haldwani. Welcome, sir. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Panak Bhushan Divedi. He is a, an alumni from PGI Chandigarh. He is now professor and head medical college Dhanbad. He is chairman Scapula Standing Group. He is president Central Zone of Indian Orthopedic Association and past president of Jharkhand Orthopedic Association. He is a very avid social worker also and he is presently additional district secretary of district 3250. Welcome Dr. Bhushan. I would request you to please share your screen. His topic of today is what is new in scapular fractures. Welcome Dr. Bhushan. Please share your screen. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Bhushan. Dr. Bhushan, please unmute yourself. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. All right. Thank you. Now I'll go for the recording. Now sharing my screen. Yes, please share. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sirohi. It has been great pleasure to be part of your CME program, which has 
already created a stir and waves throughout the country last year and all of them were viewed by so many art pods you are an avid uh, academician and you are really a social worker who has done very good things for the upliftment of our association and you are uh, bhisham pitama of your orthopedic association as well so namaskar so i'll be talking about the scapula fracture what is new then and now the question of whether we should be fixing more scapular body fracture originates from the historic preference for non operative management of these fractures recently there has been renewed interest in operative management due to recognition that a scapula malunion can cause significant disability with the treatment pendulum has swung from benign neglect to surgical indication remains controversial slight history who invented scapula it was the andreas vesalius in 1514 to 1564 flemish anatomist which has talked about it probably the oldest injured scapula from 250 millions ago was described by chinese authors of skeletal examination of a fossilized remain of a dinosaur yanguchosaurus aspigensis you can see this remains and you can see the fracture of the scapula in humans the oldest known scapula fracture dates back to the pre historic and early historic times as you can see the hippocrates and a fracture of acromion was described in the treaties of hippocrates basically scapula was very much attended explained and published by the french people pare in 1579 petit in 1723 the verney in 1751 the salt in 1798 was the first to point out the existence of these fractures in his paper des maladies extremes by xd the first drawing of a scapula fracture was presented by fort known as fort dejection it's a difficult french name i am unable to read so a scapula surgical history it becomes very important the first internal fixation of a scapula which was invented in 1500 was by the lambot in 1910 and in consecutive 10 to 15 years there were two more papers by the lane from the london in 1914 and lerotmont from the paris in 1923 if we are talking of history i am talk sharing my one of my x-rays done in 1998 and at that time there was no guidelines and the guideline was ocna orthopedic clinic of north america the saber cut approach he just came accidentally to me ki sir aapne mere scapula ka operation kiya tha and it was a reverse jude approach i did it different workers working on cadaveric scapulae there had been many anatomical variations as we are talking of a scapulae we know the standard anatomy but there are many anatomic variations which was worked by many people at many centers and i have just accumulated them the acromion we all know bigliani classification the flat type the curved type and the hooked type all the three has to be taken care of in fracture and its management if we see of the glenoid morphology it is basically a notched above on the medial aspect or the anterior aspect and flat convex on the posterior aspect and bigger on the inferior than on the superior aspect there had been again different type of glenoid as you can see type 1 the type 1 is inverted comma 
and on the right of it there is type 2 that is pear shaped if we talk of the notch then c type 1 lower in the notch type is without a notch and type 2 is with a notch and it's a deep notch again if we see this this is a suprascapular notch on the superior border at the base of the coracoid and this is first is l shaped second is j shaped third on the right upper corner is slightly curved indented fourth is absent fifth you can see that the transverse scapular ligament has started ossifying but it is not a complete ossification under it the suprascapular nerve passes and the sixth is a complete ossification above is the artery below is the nerve and if it is really complete and becomes narrow there is paralysis of supraspinatus and infraspinatus again people have worked on the spine of the scapula also this is one of the very prominent thing and this is one fracture which is always taken care of especially in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty this has of late gained very much importance so type 1 as you can see <coughs> sorry it's fusiform thin medially thin laterally and thick in the center then the totally thin it's a thin rod shape or the slender rod shape the three type 3 is thick rod shape there is no variation of the width type 4 is again thin medially and thick laterally it is known as wooden club shape and fifth is horizontal s shape or the wavy one this is to make you understand we can see the types of scapulae which has been collected from different cadavers and again you can see the fusiform shape the type 2 slender rod third is thick rod fourth is the club type and so on now if we look at the coracoid the coracoid's computed tomography done in the south africa has again shown five types of five morphological types of one is ap view of the scapula or the grassy view the second is axillary and third is a lateral view or y view for superior shoulder suspensory complex in the outlet view there is 30 degree cephalad angulation doing the serendipity view for the ac joint there is zanka view that is also 30 degree cephalad angulation but 30 percent less kv for glenoid it's a special view to show and that is known as garth view age old striker and west point views for the hill sachs region in the repeated shoulder dislocation known as recurrent shoulder dislocations now the ao has shown this the superior shoulder complex injury is very important nowadays the floating shoulder has become the most important indication of fixation of the scapula and from the time immemorial this was this was the basically indication when there is a fracture of neck of the scapula and the fracture of the clavicle the shoulder becomes floating but it has changed of late there has been a good understanding and there is non-displaced stable type there are three subtypes this is displaced stable type again b1 b2 b3 and there is unstable type c type that is c1 c2 and c3 this classification off hand you cannot remember it so every time i go for the surgery i look at it to refresh myself now the glenoid fracture classification is or age old known to be sorry 
Glenard classification is the age old classification and it is Eidelberg's classification. As you can see, the fractures of the glenoid, and I do not want to go into the detail of this type, but the fracture of glenoid anteriorly, posteriorly, the chip, the margins involving the spine, the body, inferiorly, and multiple, they have become very important for the fixation of glenoid as well as planning for the fixation of the scapula. Now, Bartonisek. Bartonisek has basically revolutionized the understanding of the fracture of a scapula by its CT classification. As you can see, a spine, a spinal pillars, fractures, line passes through the central weakened area. In this fracture, you can see the anterior view, you can see the superior view, you can see the posterior view. The types of spine pillar fractures. A is the fracture line, as you can see, it passes through the central weakened area of the scapula, which is very thin plate. And in B, the scapular spine, as you can see, in total has broken from the scapular body, where the scapular body is less affected. So the pillar fractures are with body or separate from the body. And this is a sort of avulsion fracture. Now there is a lateral pillar. Actually, once there has been planning of fixation of the scapula, people have started working, where can we put the screws and plates? Obviously, the area with the larger bone stocks were preferred, and the larger bone stocks are known as the pillars of the scapula. Basically, there are three pillars. One is the spine of a scapula, which I have already talked. The second is the lateral pillar, where the fracture is there and the fracture can be fixed. And third is the glenoid coracoid abdomen area, superior area, where the pillar is. So the A is the fracture of the, the lateral border pillar and it is the fracture of the glenoid fragment. As you can see, the long head of triceps is attached to the infraglenoid tubercle, so it has been pulled down. The second is inferior angle fragment. It is the middle part of the lateral pillar, which is there. And third is the medial border fragment. And in type B, again, the same fragments are of different proportion. Type C, it is more displaced and more affected. Now, the, if it is combinated fracture of the lateral pillar, again, Bartoni set has classified into three types. One is again, glenoid fragment, B is lateral fragment, three is inferior angle fragment, but the fourth fragment is also that there's the medial border fragment and fragment in between one, two, three, four is known as intercalary fragment. <coughs> Sorry. Now, if both the pillars are fractured, the spine of a scapula and the lateral border as depicted by the morphometry of the scapula, then <coughs> The fractures affecting the medial third of the spinal pillar and the fracture involving the central pillar. Now, once we have understood that there are pillars and the pillars are to be fixed, one thing I like to mention here that these pillars are not very thick. In the lateral border pillar, 10 to 12 millimeter of a screw is used and the spine pillar, it is eight to 10 millimeter screws are used. So it is obviously that way. Fracture of coracoid process of late has again become important because it is in the central pillar or the glenoid pillar. And first of all, it was Ogawa's classification when he has classified it. <clears throat> and this classification is type one, two, and three. 
coraco <coughs> clavicular ligament attachment is important as you can see here it was revised in 1996 by ogawa himself ayers brooks classified again in a different type he divided into more parts starting from the tip to the glenoid fossa involvement because many a times it is evolved in total from the glenoid fossa we can broadly classify it the fracture of glenoid body neck and the coracoacromian area once these fractures are there obviously they were treated by the conservative means and still 80 to 90% of the cases are treated by the conservative means but there is some need of surgery apophyseal fractures that is coracoid acromion and spine of the scapula are up to 8.2% the scapula itself is 1% of the whole body fracture and out of this 1% 8.2% is apophyseal fracture only coracoid is 3 to 4% and mostly treated conservatively therefore if we go for the indication of surgery the indication of surgery is if there is more than 10 mm of displacement or there is non union of acromion or if there is disruption of sssc as you can see here i am just giving you a couple of seconds so that you can see the arrows you can see the fractures and if this fracture as you can see in the ct scan left the conjoint tendon and the pectoralis minor which is attached to the coracoid three muscles and three ligaments these three muscles are between the in the anterior half of the coracoid and this will be pulled down and this will be an absolute indication of fixation now complication of conservative treatment we treat conservatively but all the cases do not go well what happens whether it is acceptable or not that what the need of surgery so the complication is malunion leading to pain weakness and fatigue ability loss of motion leading to disability and finally leading to shoulder drooping and deformity 20 of 48 patient has a scapular deformity in 14 years follow up that has been reported by not west in 1992 in the clinical orthopedic and related research that leads to a snapping scapula syndrome and if there is snapping scapula syndrome if there is deformity it leads to a much debated much talked about scapular dyskinesia for which there had been three scapula summits worldwide obviously uh, led by surgical indications when do we want to do the surgery these complications of dyskinesia deformity snapping a scapula has become very important if the patient starts complaining so number one is glenopolar angle is less than 20 degrees due to the pull and medialization the glenopolar angle becomes less and the abduction is affected if the medialization is 1 to 2 cm lbo that is lateral border offset and many people consider that if it is more than 22 mm one must fix it if the glenoid is caudally tilted due to the triceps pull as i have already mentioned in one of the x rays 100% translation in the lateral view of the scapula means the lateral view doesn't show any contact between the proximal fragment and the distal fragment if on the lateral view there is tilt of the body of the scapula and if it is more than 45 degrees one thing is to be noted that maybe an initial lateral view the angulation is only 20 degrees but 
if we continue to observe it after three weeks we do the x-rays and it is 45 degrees so this deformity keeps on increasing associated ssc s3c injury that is fracture clavicle or whatever it is leading to double disruption at least with one centimeter of displacement if there is a fracture of coracoid and it is unstable type there are two types stable and unstable and the displacement is more than 10 millimeters or if the fracture of base of coracoid especially in the children through the epiphysis as you already know that this coracoid was a different bone in early apes and reptiles which was later on attached to a scapula therefore this epiphysis is known as atavistic epiphysis acromion if the fracture is through body cone has described in one two three one is undisplaced two is displaced upwards and three is displaced downwards and if it is two and three displaced downwards especially it encroaches upon the supra uh, this is uh, suprahumeral space or subscapular space scapular space and the glenoid if the glenoid is more than three to five millimeter displaced if it is more than five millimeter displaced it has to be reduced and fixed and if the fragments are more than 25 percent of the size because glenoid is a very forgiving articular surface therefore it leaves you the indication is basically uh, for the correction of the joint movements. And we can see there is one joint that is clavicular acromion joint. There is another joint that is shoulder joint. There is third joint, which is thoracoscapular joint, scapulothoracic joint. So these three joints are important. Therefore, if more angulation is there, if the grenade is fractured more, if there is superior suspensory complex disruption at two, three, four cases, four disruptions, there had been only one case reported so far. GPA is glenopolar angle, as you can see. And this, you can see that it is less than 20 degrees. It should be 30 to 45 degrees. And there is a great displacement. Here, the angulation, if it is more than 45 degrees, the scapulothoracic motion is affected and dyskinesia is bound to occur. Should be measured after one, two, three weeks again. This lateral border offset, as you can see, it is definitely much more than 22 millimeters. These, all the three cases are to be affected, operated. The GOSS in 2013 has described that superior shoulder suspensory complex is something like this. And he has a made a circle popularly known as Goss circle, where you can see the glenoid cavity, acromion, coracoacromial ligament, acromioclavicular joint, clavicle, coracoclavicular joint, and again, the base of coracoid. This makes a circle. And if it is broken at any place, any place, it is affected. The beautiful part is that Coracoacromial ligament, if it, this is also disrupted, this is also taken as disruption of the Gauss circle or the S3C. Again, in this disruption, if it is more than one millimeter, then it's important. If it is less than one millimeter, it is not important. CC ligament, coracoclavicular ligament, if the fracture of clavicle is lateral to both or in between the two and medial to it, it has three presentations and the displacement of clavicle and a stress view can always guide us. So this superior shoulder suspensory complex is again a big thing people are talking about it. As you can see this fracture, the way it was repaired, the neck, the spine and the clavicle also. But how to approach it? Long back, Jude has done the vertical medial and horizontal over the spine of a scapula then 
erase the deltoid from the spine of the scapula, erase the whole incised penatus along with its nerve and blood supply up to the lateral border, maybe up to the glenoid. So there are different approaches as you can see, that is Zude approach, there is mirror Jude approach, that's inverted mirror. Then there is modified Jude approach and the reverse Jude approach, which I had shown in my first uh, 1998 X-ray. And last is minimally invasive, which has become nowadays popular for a single fracture of the lateral pillar. The vulnerable area from the posterior aspect is the strangle. The strangle, as you can see, 4 centimeter by 8 centimeter by 7 centimeters. This area, 4, 7, 8 triangle, is to be taken care of. All the vital structures are here only. The surgical technique, the challenges are more. Nowadays, it has become slightly easier to repair it due to the gadgets. You have to use the shank pins, you have to use the hooks, you have to use the clamps by making two small holes and bringing it together. All the pelvic instruments and their miniature has come to this level. There was a time when it was very difficult to repair the glenoid. But thanks to the shoulder arthroplasty people, they have devised many instruments for that. Now, there are, these are the standard plates. These plates have been made by a, a real biomechanical and bioengineering people, which meets all the curvatures of a scapula and they are separate for the lateral border, the spine scapula and the medial border, the acromion, and even for the coracoid and its space. We have Indian version also, as you can see, this is innovative company, which has started making the titanium scapula plates, and that is 2.7 millimeter plates with locking options. As a glenoid fossa fracture, eight out of 21 cases were operated and the surgeon's indication, Ramesh Sain's paper is there, was more than five millimeter displacement. Our president Ramesh Sain has presented this paper and it was published in IJO. So 21 cases. And as I told you, there are gadgets and there are numerous. With the help of all these gadgets, we can access the glenoid fossa. Again, when Ramesh did it, he did not have all these gadgets as he frankly admitted. It was a difficult thing. And at that, at that time, only Fukuda retractor was his respite. Again, as you can see, this has been done by Yas, this fracture and its fixation. Complications are there. As I have talked about the complications of conservative treatment, there are complications of operative treatment as well. Hardegger and Jones have presented it. There had been a similar result as performed by Jones in 2011. And the outcome, as I can narrate, the surgical treatment of extra articular scapular fracture remains controversial due to acceptable result of non-operative treatment and lack of high quality evidence comparing operative to non-operative treatment. However, not all extra-articular scapular fractures can uniformly be treated non-operatively with reproducibly excellent clinical outcomes. So, should we be fixing more of these? Yes. Now, I would like to share a couple of YouTube presentations here, floating shoulder, myth and reality. There has been episodes and it is 27 minutes. As you can see, two hours, 12 minutes. This is a presentation 
of Egypt. Fracture of shoulder by the crake. He has also presented it on YouTube for 30 minutes. And these are all YouTubes of 21 and 22. Again, this is the shoulder planet update of the scapular trauma. They have also spent there around 40 minutes talking about the scapular trauma. There is trauma fellows webinar of AO trauma. They have also talked about the scapular glenoid in the last two years. This is AO trauma update of North America. AO trauma North America has spent around more than one hour discussing about it and the floating shoulder by the Egypt people like Ahmad Jayad has also talked about it for 45 minutes. The thing is that scapula nowadays is being talked by AO, by effort. Effort in two months have written two reviews about the scapula fracture in the last months of 21. And what effort says? Effort says that if we operate the scapula, we do not produce bad results. That is one thing definite. And we do not produce complications of snapping the scapula and shoulder dyskinesia and drooping of the shoulder and deformed shoulder and affection of the movement and getting sensation of the shoulder dating to osteoarthritis. So somehow we have come to a level when we should be fixing more of them. Thank you. Am I audible? Thank you, Dr. Bhushan. Very illustrative lecture. We will be having discussion time at the end of the second talk. Right, sir. Meanwhile, Dr. Jitin Mayashuri has also joined us. Welcome, sir. Thank you, thank you. Let me introduce you and welcome you, sir. Uh, as he was caught up in the traffic, uh, so he has come here now. Uh, Dr. Mayashuri, he has uh, joined as chairman of Abhinav Bindra Sports Injury Center Sitaram Bharthiya Hospital, New Delhi. Formerly, he was director of orthopedics at Max Sakit. And uh, before that, he was an additional professor at AIMS, New Delhi. He has written a very good book, Essential Orthopedics. And he specializes in knee and shoulder surgery only. Today, he will be talking proximal humor, humerus fractures learning never stops over to you dr maishwari please share thank you okay i'll just share my screen yes sir okay just give me one minute and I'll enlarge this so sorry for the delay first of all dr Suroi, and i got stuck in an operation and thank god you called me up otherwise i would have just missed this and I rushed home because my computer was at home and I realized how backward I am. I all my data should have been on the net and I could have probably presented from the hospital itself. But anyway, God is kind and I'm here. And I, de I decided to change my topic a little bit because, you know, preparing that talk, uh, I got lost actually. Proximal is humerus fracture is something which every day when I see a case, it, it really bothers me because no one case I can say this is the right treatment for this case. And when I take the case to the OT, I have all the options from minimally invasive to plating to hemiarthroplasty to reverse everything. And I'm quite surprised how every other case I'll end up doing something that I did not plan. It's a big, big uh, maze. And I'm quite amazed how even after so many years of experience, I'm still lost. So I thought I'll actually come back to some very basic topic, which a lot of people who are attending would relate to. And that is Philo's 
how can we do it better something very simple probably everybody knows it by now but i still thought there are a few things that i have learned over the years and especially seeing mistakes happening all around me so let me take you through this uh, a little different kind of a topic sorry dr suroi for taking the liberty to change the topic but i thought this will be better for the audience that we are addressing so um, philos seems to have revolutionized the fixation of proximal humerus fracture so people like me are from an era where we used to do plating like that all kind of plates came and you you can see how those plates were not successful and finally philos came and it seems to be doing quite well and still there are changes in the proximal humerus fracture but philos still has had a very long inning but there are lots of complications i see at least three or four failed philos every month coming from all over and when philos fails tell let me tell you there is almost no option that patient you cannot do anything short of doing a reverse sural arthroplasty which you can't do very often so i thought still there is a scope for all of us to understand how we can do this so called common lovely surgery very well there are complication rates reported up to almost 25% in lot of publications 12 studies and you know avn 8% screw cut out so almost 24% cases have complication which can we can say one out of every four case will have a complication so that kind of a surgery can be really disaster for the surgeon and the patient again one of our own uh, dr bansal published at in 2015 and you can see how many complications can happen malreduction screw penetration all time so there is still a scope of improving if you understand what are the loose points in doing these surgeries and i am going to emphasize those in this talk so there are three major pitfalls when you do philos surgery and this is what i have learned from others mistakes also my own mistakes first is lack of proper reduction on the table second is how you put your plates and screws properly so that you don't end up with complications and third very important and which is not given too much importance during surgery is tuberosity reconstruction sound enough that there can be good shoulder functions so i'll come to these three points one by one so the most important principle of reduction any surgery in trauma is actually reduction we all know it but everywhere else in the body like femur like humerus you can easily take ap and lateral even in the hip we have got used to taking a good lateral view very well but somehow when it comes to shoulder because of poor positioning is very often not possible to do take a good ap and a lateral and that's where we land up accepting less than perfect reduction and when i see these cases who come to me as failed cases and i look at x ray number 1 x ray number 2 x ray number 3 more often than not it is the poor reduction on the table which was the culprit so what can we do to get a good reduction so to get a good reduction you should be able to see things inside the ot with the image intensifier and that is where the crux of getting a good reduction lies how do you place your image intensifier in such a way that without changing the position of the patient you should be able to see ap and lateral and this is what i do the patient is on the side of the table with the shoulder hanging out and we stabilize the head very well so that while pushing and pulling is happening the patient should not be coming off the table so tie the tummy of the patient tie the head of the patient and get the shoulder out of the uh, table either on a radiolucent table or what i use is i use a mobile mayo trolley so i can move it in and out as and when i want and then you position your image intensifier from the head end so in this case without changing the position of the patient you can actually take ap lateral and these are correct ap lateral a lot of people what they do is they bring the image intensifier from the other side they can do take a good ap but they cannot take a lateral and what they do is they try to rotate the arm you can never rotate a arm with a fracture something like 90 degree you cannot and you run the risk of losing the reduction so 
this is the best way that you bring the patient out, get your image from the head end, move the image AP lateral and a good AP and lateral is available all the time. And that is very important for seeing reduction, which is always so in every orthopedic case. You have to have a good AP and lateral. Now, once you have put the patient in traction, you have to check the anatomy of the fracture. In traction, it appears very different. You know, all our pre-op x-rays, CT scan will not give you the right information. It's only when you do an x-ray under traction, you actually see what this x-ray or what this fracture is all about. So often I have to change my plan when I do x-ray interaction. What was appearing a sing single two-part fracture and I realized that this was a four-part fracture or even a head split fracture. And I have to change my plan on the table. And you have to see these things when you have a reduction on the table because that will help you to plan your surgery. Is there a medial combination? If there's a medial combination, you better be sure that you take care of that combination during surgery by whatever method and I will come to those methods. More importantly, posterior combination. A lot of times we forget that there is a posterior combination also. And if we don't want to take care of that, don't reduce it well. The fracture can go into a posterior angulation despite a good fixation because more often than not, the bones are osteoporotic. If your reduction is not okay, if there's a combination posteriorly, if there's a combination medially, whatever you may fix, the fracture has a great chance of displacing. And that is the biggest problem and then the screws start coming out. The position of the head. When you reduce the fracture, the head has to be in front of the glenoid in AP and the lateral view. Not only AP. So often than not, people just do AP view, rotate it a little bit, and they don't realize that in the lateral view, the head is not reduced properly. Also, the GT and the LT position has to be checked. And we must remember this X-ray in our eyes. And if, if you like, in the beginning, you can put up a normal shoulder x-ray on the view box and compare your shoulder with that. Your GT has to be below the head and the head has to be in front of the glenoid. If these two things are okay, you have got a good reduction. And if you have not got a good reduction, you cannot proceed in fixing this fracture because if you fix it wrong, the screws and bolts and plates, everything will come out, open up. And this is what the lateral view should look. It should look something like a bulb. In the long axis, the bulb should be sitting. Very often I see this fracture because the head is round. Sometimes you cannot make out. The round thing may be actually sitting here posteriorly. And that's not correct. It has to be round circle visible like a bulb. Then only you can see your fracture is reduced in lateral position. So this is about how you can be sure that you have achieved a good reduction in AP and lateral view by putting the CM properly and by taking proper AP and lateral views. Now, once you have seen in C arm, then you have to expose the fracture. And I find again, exposing a shoulder is not so easy. It's not a common surgery. Average orthopedic does not end up opening shoulders so often and they struggle. And I will give you some tips how to get a good exposure of a proximal humerus when you are fixing it. More often than not, people fix it with a deltopectoral approach. And I would not go into the debate whether you should use a deltopectoral or a deltoid split approach. That's a big discussion in itself. But more often than not, because most people are quite used to using a deltopectoral approach, it is quite okay. If you know some tips, you can manage most fractures very well with deltopectoral approach. The first tip is, that you cut this proximal one centimeter of the pectoral is major because this muscle pulls the distal fragment medially and does not allow the reduction to happen. The second tip is elevate distal attachment of the deltoid. So very often I've seen when you're retracting the deltoid to find the tuberosity or to find the head, in spite of the best retraction, a retraction, you cannot see what is happening in this area. And it is quite, you cannot detach the muscle here because that, that will never heal and you will end up with weakness. What you can do is you can elevate and erase almost the anterior half of the deltoid. It doesn't matter. It will fall back there, it will heal up again, but you cannot detach the muscle from here to be able to see. So once you detach it from there, the whole thing opens up much better and you can see the proximal end of the humerus much better then it is very important to do a blunt dissection 
under the deltoids with a finger. Because if the fracture has got even three, four, ten days late, the deltoid get adhered to the bone and you cannot find the planes. So deltoid is a big muscle. If you mobilize it with the help of a finger all over, all around the head, it will make your life easy and deltoid retraction will be much easier. Otherwise, you'll end up retracting too much and you actually you cause a lot of damage to the deltoid by your retractor itself. Also, there is a need to do blunt dissection of subacromial space with finger. So that is very important because a lot of time there are pieces of GT which displays and lie under the acromion and you have finished your operation and you don't realize that you have left a piece of GT with supraspinatus in the under, under the acromion and that is a failure because that patient will have a drop arm syndrome. There'll be no active abduction possible. So put your finger under the acromion Mobilize the area there, whatever, you know, loose uh, synovial tissues or bursal tissues, you remove them. Similarly, there may be a lot of synovial and bursal tissue under the deltoid, remove them. And now you can see the bone very well. These are the special tips to get a good exposure for a proximal humerus. Now, the second principle is tuberosity planning. And I will emphasize this because more often than not, we tend to spend time fixing the head to the shaft. And you know, a whole of our energy in the surgery is spent in getting the right reduction between the humerus head and the shaft. Whereas the very critical is tuberosity. If tuberosities don't heal properly and head and shaft are properly positioned, it becomes like a rotator cuff tear shoulder and patient will have a drop arm syndrome. So tuberosity pl planning right in the beginning of the surgery where tuberosities are going to lie, how you're going to fix has to be planned even before you put your plate. So first is understand tuberosity or osteotomy, anatomy. And you have all kinds of tuberosity. You can have a very simple one-piece tuberosity, very simple to find out where it will go in the shaft. There'll be a notch here you can align it with. Simple, no problem. But very often the tuberosity has multiple fragments. And some of these fragments actually may may be missed, they may be out of your eyes and you may be thinking you put tuberosity back whereas this fragment has actually flown and gone away. And you once you put the plate, you cannot see whether the tuberosity is in position. So unless you have found the tuberosity by putting two or three sutures, stray sutures, and you have tried to understand how the tuberosity, tuberosity will be reconstructed, you will lose the tuberosity fixation and that will lead to disaster of a drop arm syndrome. And I see those kind of cases, very well done plating. It looks like almost like a book picture, but the patient comes with a drop arm syndrome because one of the piece of the tuberosity is not taken care or it has got pulled off and there is a failure. So stay suture with minimum crushing is required. When you're handling tuberosities, don't try to hold them with rough cockers. Just hold them very gently with some towel clip or something maybe a bone hook and don't use a crushing instruments. Otherwise, it becomes again difficult to fix them very well. Now, after basic exposure has been done and you have taken the stock of the fracture and the tuberosities, put them together and see how they look under image intensifier. No plating as yet. You have to see how your temporary placement of the head and shaft relationship. There's no varus, there's no valgus, there's no posterior tilt. And similarly, your head and tuberosity relationship. You can use one or two K wires to fix these things and make up your mind whether you've got the right reduction in AP and lateral view. Only when you've got this, then only lift the plate. Otherwise, don't. We sometimes are in a hurry to just fix the plate half-heartedly and then we'll end up in a problem because we, we have not understood where the tuberosities will go. And once you have put the plate, you have no place for the tuberosity to go in. So these are very, very important things when you're doing these fractures. So check whether the where the tuberosity wants to go after reducing the head. So once you have reduced the head, the tuberosity is in place, try to match them with whatever anatomy of the shaft is there. If you can't match them, tie these two wires, stay sutures together and take an X-ray. Only when you know in which direction you're going to put, pull your wires, it will give you the impression about where the tuberosity wants to come. So finally, when you're fixing them, that is the way you have to reduce them. And all this has to be done before you put your plate. 
After you put your plate, you may be lost. There will be no place for the tuberosity to go and you will have a tuberosity failure. So once you have understood this, the reduction of the head and the tuberosities, then we are in game and we have to see a picture like this where head is in front of the glenoid, we have reduced it. The tuberosity is below the head, we have reduced it. And now in AP and lateral, everything looks quite good and we are ready to use our plate. And before we do that, we fix them temporarily with one or two or three K wires, remembering that K wires should not be in the area where you are going to put the plate, which is internal lateral part. So if you want to pass this K wire plus from interior side or little posterior lateral, leave that corridor where the plate is going to come open and so that otherwise you'll have to remove the wires in between and you might lose the reduction. So when you're doing a temporary fixation, it's very important to put two, three K wires and if one of them comes in your way of putting the plate, you can always remove it. Now the third principle is correct place plate, uh, placement of the plate. As you know, we can put the plate anywhere and once it is put, you don't want to remove it and later on we find we have put it in the wrong place and the plate is causing impingement or it is too low and you cannot pass your, you know, uh, the, 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 the calcar screw. So it is written in the books, this is the way you should put the plate and be sure that before you put your first screw, you can pass a couple of wires to temporarily fix this plate where you want it to put. It should be posted to the bicipital groove. It should be align aligned along the shaft, particularly this part of the shaft. It should not be hanging here and there because otherwise it causes what we call helicopter effect and you cannot fix it distally very well. So before you start putting your first bolt, the plate has to sit properly on the lateral side of the humerus and also distally about five to eight millimeter from the tip of the uh, from the tip of the GT. So once you have planned that, then you can put the plate. Now you can play with the plate. Sometimes your reduction is not okay and you're struggling. And if it is a medial displacement like this, you can do indirect reduction by putting a cortical screw. So you put one or two drill bits here, only drill bits, not the screw, and then put a, a cortical screw. And by that you can do indirect reduction and put this distal fragment, pull it towards the plate. Similarly, you can push it also. And remember, put only drills and not the screws. Once you put the bolts, it will not be possible to move things. And you can also do with this, you can put a locking screw, which will push this fragment that way. But you are only putting drill on the other side. So you can use these tricks to get a better reduction. Fine, fine tuning can be done once you have achieved a good reduction and fixed it with the help of K wires. The fourth principle is where to put bolts and screws and how many and how long. Now we always put as many as you can, but basic principle is the bolt should be holding in the area where there's a lot of bone. So this is a normal humerus. You can put screws anywhere, but more often than not in elderly, this area is all empty. This is the only area where you can put the screws. There's no need to put the screws all the way down to the subchondral bone. There's no need because if you try to do that, you can always perforate or they can perforate later because of collapse. It is okay to put your screws about five millimeter to one centimeter short of the subchondral bone. Even there, there is a lot of bone. So currently most people follow that there's no need to go exactly subchondral because then there's a risk of screw penetration which can be bigger disaster. How long? Of course, not all the way, only five millimeter or even one centimeter short if the patient is actually young. The top screw should not be too long. It is always the, when the virus collapse happens, it is the top screws which are the culprit. So keep them short. Similarly, anterior screws, because the collapse happens in external rotation, keep the anterior screws. And if you remember Philos, it has anteriorly going screws, it has posteriorly going screws. So top screws and the anteriorly growing screws, keep them shorter than longer. Other ones you can keep fairly long. So you have to be tricky. So even if your fracture moves, the screw cut out, cut out should not happen. And you can put as many as you like. Of course, the key screws are these, the, particularly the calcar screws, if you have a medial combination. So this is a little bit of a tips about where to put screws, how long and how you can avoid cutting out. Now, tightening of the tuberosity is very important. I often see 
once people take a stay suture and the plate is put, they tie the tuberosity and they use all their force to tighten the tuberosity because they want it to be very well fitting. But that's not correct. If you tie the tuberosity too tight, something like this, you're creating a tension in the rotator cuff. This will fail. This tuberosity cannot be here. It has to be exactly where it has to be. Similarly, if you put a plate and then you put tuberosity on top of it, it will never heal or it will erode because of the plate. So you have to plan all this before you put the plate and also you have to plan how much tension to give to the tuberosity. Don't just put it absolutely tight because it can be too tight and it can create tension in the rotator cuff which can cause failure. Of course, you have to be very sure that you don't leave a fragment under the acromion. So these are the common mistakes I see when I see cases where they don't do so well. And the final check is the head and shaft are reduced well. No screw is out. You have to check it again and again by rotating, by taking a proper AP and lateral. And one finger under the acromion at the end. I sometimes do even subacromial decompression if I find there is my little finger is not going in. And GT and LT have to be nicely fixed to the plate by multiple sutures. So the key concept is to create the medial hinge, which is the commonest culprit. You can do it if it is a well-reduced fracture, even with percutaneous wires and it will not collapse. You can use a calcar screw if you're using a plate. You can use even a medial buttress screw and a, and a, and a graft. If there's a lot of combination here, put a small corticocancellous graft here, stop it with one, it acts as a buttress, does not let the collapse happen. Or also, if it's a bad fracture, you can use a fibula inside and that will also give. Lack of medial stability is a cause of varus collapse, which is a very common complication in these fractures. And these are few methods which have to be careful. So you get a good fixation. Despite there's a combination, you don't have a problem. And there are some newer plates. I will just touch upon these, which have been used to help uh, surgeons to tide over. And I think they are in the market and almost everybody knows about it. Some of the additional tips I like to give you, keep anchors in your OT if you're doing your proximal humerus. Sometimes you fix the plate, now you don't know where to fix the tuberosity. You can use the anchor in the bone and then take a bite. Similarly, arthroscopic suture passer can help in taking bites. Sometimes your needles will not go all the way in. You cannot take a bite and in that area, you can use suture passer. Use loose needles and these are available. They are small sturdy needles and they help you to work in the subacromial space sometimes. Otherwise, big needles don't go there. And be prepared to do a subacromial decompression if you cannot put your one finger at the end of the operation under the acromion. Also, be prepared to immobilize your case if you're not too sure, the bone quality is not good. There's no harm in immobilizing it in neutral position. Not in a sling, but in a neutral position like this for maybe three to four weeks and that will save you from a embarrassment of a fracture collapsing. There's no harm, you can always mobilize them a little longer. So three pulse I would like to summarize is reduction and for that a good imaging, good positioning, AP lateral all the time, careful about GT and LT fixation, find them out, plan where they would like to sit before putting the plate and also precaution of delayed collapse by taking care of the medial combination. With this, I'll end my talk. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And uh, sorry about being late again, Dr. Suroi, once again. Thank you, Dr. Mahishwari, sir. Very nice presentation. And I hope uh, it will help minimize the errors fixing the phyllos and the proximal shoulder by other means also. Uh, we have already exceeded our time. It was planned from 8 to 9. It was started a few minutes late, 5 minutes. Uh, so, Dr. Puneet, is there any question from the audience? Uh, sir, till now there is no question on my chat box. So, no question from you, sir, because I have given that it should be addressed to you, your number only. Okay. Dr. Ganesh? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Any questions from your side? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, one little question uh, uh, regarding scapula fracture, sir. If, yes. uh, uh, 
सर इन केसेस ऑफ फ्लोटिंग शोल्डर व्हाट इज द ऑर्डर ऑफ फिक्सेशन बाय सर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम क्लेविकल क्लेविकल फर्स्ट शोल्डर है क्लेविकल फर्स्ट एज रेकमेंडेड बाय एओ आल्सो एंड इफ इट इज अ बॉडी फ्रैक्चर स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द मीडियल फर्स्ट डॉक्टर तरुण नो सर इट वाज अ वेरी डीप एंड थॉरो लेक्चर्स बाय भूषण सर एंड महेश्वरी सर एज यूजुअल सो एज ऑफ नाउ नो क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम माय साइड सो सर थैंक यू वेरी मच सर आई लाइक टू शेयर वन मोर थिंग सिरोही साहब जी सर माय नेम इज पन्नग भूषण इट्स हिंदी संस्कृत वर्ड यस पन्नग मींस स्नेक पदे न गति सह पन्नगर एंड माई फुल नेम इज पन्नग भूषण तर्प हो आप भूषण किसका पन्नग पन्नग भूषण पन्नग भूषण सॉरी फॉर द रॉन्ग प्रोनाउंसिएशन देव भूमि कहे आप इसलिए आपको कहा भाई की चलिए नहीं नहीं सर मुझे याद आ गया एक बार आपने झारखंड में भी वहाँ हजारीबाग में भी बताया था आई गॉट इट थैंक यू सर थैंक यू डॉक्टर महेश्वर जी थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच आई विल रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर पुनीत अग्रवाल थैंक यू जितेंद्र सर थैंक यू भूषण सर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ उत्तराखंड ऑर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन दिस इज अवर फर्स्ट वेबिनार ऑफ दिस सीरीज सो वी लाइक कि आप नेक्स्ट टाइम भी हम लोगों के प्रोग्राम में जरूर आए थैंक यू थैंक्स टू अवर पैनलिस्ट थैंक्स टू ऑर्थो टी वी थैंक्स टू अवर सर थैंक यू एवरीबडी थैंक यू गुड नाइट सर थैंक यू सर गुड नाइट थैंक यू डॉक्टर अशोक अशोक सर थैंक यू आर यू देयर He has done his job. <laughs> he has, he has done his job, but he will have to stop it also. Thank we are all thankful to him. Night. He will listen to this recording. We are all very thankful to him. Yes, sir. thank you, Oscar. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Good night, sir. Thank you.